we're sacrificing quality of life on the altar of longevity. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. One of the things that that we have in prison system is protection, which is, you know, a um, kind of isolated uh, area of the prison away from the general population. And usually people who go there um, are are there because um, they either have enemies within the system or perhaps they've committed a crime that is considered heinous even by the other prisoners, uh, particularly child offences or or, um, similar um, that would mean that they couldn't live in general population. They, they wouldn't be safe there. Um, and even more than that, there would be um, parts of the prison that involve um, isolation or, or segregation. And that's where the person stays in their own cell. They don't interact with anybody else. They come out for maybe a few hours a day to exercise or access open air or make phone calls, but otherwise they're by themselves. And the, it's interesting to see the psychological effects that that has on a person. Um, they're profound. And the decision that uh, some of those prisoners end up having to make is um, that exact kind of scenario, quality of life over the uh, long, longevity. Do I take a risk to start to interact with other people knowing that one of them may end up being somebody who would attack me or do I continue to live my life totally isolated from other people, perhaps locked down for 23 hours a day in my own cell in order to extend my life? And some people, and this is really interesting to me, will make the decision to remain isolated. In fact, they become really institutionalised and they start to feel Um, safest and most comfortable when they are isolated and and behind locked doors. Uh, I do wonder if uh, we've seen a bit of that kind of shift more recently with people being prepared to sacrifice things that previously would have been, uh, you know, considered to be really important for their satisfaction in their lives for this promise of safety. That's that's a question, isn't it? That's a bit. That's a really important question, uh, and and I hear I hear people would say, "Well, what? What? You, do you just want to let it let it run loose? You know, let it rip your nanny killer that sort of stuff? Um, why don't you just take bite the bullet and do what's what's good for everyone else? Something about yourself for once in a while." Uh, what would you say to someone who would who would have that kind of response to those? Well, let's let's make let's make a bit of a, uh, a sacrifice here to understand, well, sacrifice is probably a bad word for that, but let's, let's make these choices that we can, we can cater to, to a person's quality of life. Yeah, I think you're right because it's a false dichotomy. Um, you, two things can be true at the same time. Uh, yes, the virus poses a risk to some people and there are things that we should do together in order to protect those that are vulnerable but at the same time does that necessarily mean uh, giving up uh, liberties or or things that are in our lives uh, in order to achieve that and I think to to um, put those two things together is creating that false dichotomy And, and we've really seen a lot of that that it's really a straw man kind of an argument um and again it it resorts to that ad hominem attack the labeling of nanny killer that you mentioned there before um if anyone thinks that a certain um you know measure like lockdown that we mentioned before isn't the best approach then they must want people to die uh and that's not a helpful way to to frame the conversation i think it's actually intellectually Uh, dishonest as well the other thing that people seem to throw regularly is this idea that um and you talked about it before um surely we should just go along with whatever is going to uh whatever the experts are telling us is going to be best for everybody and um you know i'm not sure how familiar you are with thomas Sowell. 
Um, no. But he's a, an economist. He's written lots of um, really interesting uh, books. He's a very, very clear thinker. And he wrote a book called uh, Intellectuals and Society. And part of the uh, premise of that is a critique on a shift towards the idea that um, intellectuals, if intellectuals were kind of put in charge of decision making, that society would be better. And that there are really things that only experts can understand. And the rest of us should just take the advice that they give. And part of the point that he makes is that even if someone is extremely uh, expert in a particular area, there's only a fraction of the knowledge that's possible about that um, topic that that person could know. Um, and then outside of that, there are all sorts of other considerations, um, you know, the kind of ripple effect of any decision that they might make in their narrow area of expertise that they wouldn't be aware of and couldn't take into consideration. So, whenever you leave a, a decision to someone who has a narrow lens of expertise, there are unintended consequences. And so a better alternative is, yes, we can use the knowledge of experts and intellectuals, but we should never use it in isolation. It should always be in a collaboration um, and that there's, there's um, multiple pieces of information that need to be considered. They need to be balanced. Um, and, and that's certainly something that uh, I would kind of respond to people with when they have this idea that, no, there's only one sort of so, um, uh, course of action that's defensible in this situation because the experts have told us that. Well, those experts may be giving the best advice from their narrow area of expertise. And perhaps just as a quick example, um, the idea of flattening the curve. Uh, we, we heard this a lot um, during the pandemic, but we'll flatten the curve, uh, take the pressure off hospital beds, and we'll do that by implementing some restrictions, uh, including things like lockdown, um, so that the spread of the virus is minimised. Now, that may be a really good measure if you're thinking only about suppressing spread of the virus. But if you were to listen to other people, perhaps mental health experts, who are, are considering the effects of isolation, or maybe education experts who are considering what, it, what the effect will be of taking children out of school, or maybe child protection who are saying, what if we no longer have children uh, in the protective environment of school or childcare away from a potentially abusive person in their life. These are all other areas of expertise that need to be weighed up in that decision-making. Uh, so that's kind of, that's my concern about this idea of an expert advising something for the greater good is that there's a whole lot of other pieces of information that aren't considered.